Hey friends, welcome back. I'm here today with Dr. Scott Resnick. He's over in Whistler, Canada. Dr. Resnick is formally trained in surgery and OBGYN, and he noticed a trend when working with patients that the more alternative type therapies that he was implementing, the more progress he was seeing. And some people were even avoiding surgery, which led him to complete a fellowship in functional medicine. Uh, but one thing that I don't think he did see coming, as he shared with me, is that he didn't expect to become a patient himself. So one reason I know, or I think you're really going to find this interview useful, is not only does Dr. Resnick have a ton of professional and medical experience um, treating fatigue conditions, he's also been a patient himself after a, a major crash happened, after some significant stressful events in his life. So very excited to dive into uh, all of the strategies, practical strategies that he's been using to treat the number one complaint he gets from his patients, which is um, fatigue conditions. So Dr. Resnick, thank you so much for doing this today. Oh, and thank you for that warm welcome. It's really nice to be here and I'm looking forward to uh, sharing this discussion with you. Yeah. So I, I think we'd all really love to hear a little bit to start about how your own health journey went and how that impacted, um, you know, your, your medical practice and how you chose to approach things moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think this will be helpful for your, you know, your viewers and listeners as well, because, um, you know, personally, as you mentioned, I'm formally trained in, I did half of a general surgical residency. I did four years of OBGYN, which was six years of training after doing four years of medical school. And this was in the, um, in the nineties and, um, the training was a little different. So it wasn't uncommon for us to work 120 to 130 hours a week. And, and this was, you know, very high stress. So I did that for six years of my life. And then I, um, moved with my wife at the time to a small town in northern New Mexico where we were two of the only OBGYN doctors in this town. And so the, the long hours, the late nights, the high stress continued for real, really another decade. Um, and what happened was at, in about 2014, I'd started my um, doing the studies for the fellowship in, in anti-aging and regenerative medicine in like 2012, 2013. And in 2014, we moved to Tennessee for five years. And simultaneously, I was working as a doctor. I was building a house. I was buying a house. I was selling a house. All three of those needed to be coordinated coordinated together so we could, you know, kind of leave Taos and go move to Tennessee. And and I crashed. And um and I think that it was really, you know, as you know, um there are some people who do develop fatigue syndromes like like overnight. You know, they're everything's great and they, they wake up one day. You know, and we've probably seen more of this with post COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Um but I think that for a lot of us it's it's been a gradual process and it's been something that, that develops over over a period of time. And I think that many of us don't realize that we're burning the candles and starting to wear down some of our body's resources to be able to compensate for, I mean, face it, life is filled with stressors, right? I mean, that's a, the human animal is pretty well adapted to be able to, you know, su support itself or go find food or defend itself. But we have limits. And so what happened personally was um, I found myself um, like almost like walking around in this fog. I, and I know that a lot of your viewers know it's like there's a buzzing kind of feeling. There's this almost like outer worldly kind of feeling sometimes that you have where you're not able to really connect or someone's talking to you or you just heard something and you can't remember what it was. Uh, for me, one of the biggest signs of, of understanding what it felt like to be truly fatigued was when I remember several occasions when I would be driving in the mid-afternoon. I'm talking like two or three in the afternoon and I would literally have to pull over on a rural road and, and go to sleep because I just felt that my continuing driving was putting me and other drivers um, at risk. And what I did is, you know, I thought, oh, it's like I, I eat well, I exercise, I'm too healthy. I'm not, I don't have chronic fatigue syndrome. And I did the usual spate of labs and of course everything came back normal. So what I needed to do is I needed to really take some time and reevaluate um, and ask some different questions um, with myself. And, and I guess jumping to the punchline would be that uh, I did a uh, salivary four part cortisol test and, and really the cortisol was almost flatlined. And, um, it was really eye opening to, to realize that I had worked myself into a state of, you know, I don't like using the term adrenal fatigue because the adrenal glands do not fatigue. And I think it's really important for people to recognize that. Um, we drive ourselves into a state of low cortisol. And I actually think that that's one of the biggest factors that's uh, associated with a chronic fatigue syndrome. 
while the research supports that, um, you know, really there are a lot of different factors at play. So depending on someone's, you know, their individual genetics, where they live, their personal history, their stresses, their dietary choices, all these different things are going to have a different degree of impact um, on the individual. And the important thing from the bottom of all this is, is, is to not try to lump everybody into one big container because we're all different. And, and I think it, um, it's important to develop a strategy to try to look into, you know, what is driving this. And, and when I was able to reflect upon my, my journey, I recognized that I was just doing too much. I was staying up late, delivering babies. I was traveling around the state, going to different hospitals. Like I said, I was buying, building, and selling a house all, all at the same time uh, and leaving a community I've been in for 15 years. So that's, that's kind of my, my backstory. Um, and then, and then that's to be, um, you know, looked at in, in respect to the fact that as a women's health spe specialist, and as you know, I mean, the, you know, the sort of the chronic fatigue, uh, myalgias are probably a little more common in, in women, although neither sex is immune. It's been something that I've been working with, um, with a number of patients in my practice for some time as well. So, you know, all of a sudden the doctor becomes a patient and I needed to start making some steps to figure out what I needed to do for myself to begin to heal. You know, obviously we never want anyone to get any of these conditions because it, it can be absolute hell and it's a nightmare to go through. Mm -hmm. And the best case scenario is that no one ever gets anything like chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. But I think sometimes if it has to happen, if it has to hit some people, the silver lining of some doctors like yourself going through this is that we have more people with understanding and knowledge and experience on the other side, you know, right. because I'm sure you hear a lot of people expressing frustration when they're going into conventional medical systems with mm -hmm. conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome or long COVID and the doctors sometimes just really don't know what to do with that. So I'm very sorry you've had to go through that, but I'm so glad that this, um, you know, has sounds like it's shaped your your scope and your passion for the work that you do. Um, oh, unquestionably. One thing that I've come to realize is that uh, chronic fatigue, I believe, is a chronic condition with acute exacerbations. So I really believe, and this is having worked with thousands of patients, that um, in spite of the fact that it is multifactorial, you know, it, it, it can, there are a lot of different aspects we can touch, with it, whether it's gut or hormones or adrenal glands or what have you. But I think that once somebody like you or I have really tanked out our, our, our adrenal glands, I think what's happened is it's kind of readjusted the, the threshold to be able to do that again. <clears throat> and, and for myself, I can tell you that my daily practice to maintain my health is to have a daily practice to maintain my health. In other words, I, I know that if I were to go off on some writing or filming or developing or, or traveling frenzy, before long, I would find myself experiencing some of the similar symptoms I've had before. So I've, what I recognize is that I think that once we've, um, you know, developed a point of, um, gotten to a point of chronic fatigue, we need to be very vigilant to understand what the triggers are, um, learn what those triggers are and ensure that we don't sort of step back into that minefield because once we've kind of tanked our adrenal glands or once we've developed, uh, you know, the myalgias and the, and the pains or something, it, we're not that far away from being able to slip back into that. And just out of curiosity, have you, have you experienced something like that? I mean, do you notice that you're, um, you need to keep an eye on, you know, how late it is you stay up watching movies at night? Um, you know, how many nights a week you go out? Um, how many hours you spend exercising? Oh, absolutely. And I've got a checklist, an actual checklist for me every day that I follow, like get some early morning sun, meditate, check it off, go to the gym, check it off. And I don't always get all of it. And I don't stress, you know, life sometimes you, you can't get everything perfectly, but I definitely do. I'm very vigilant about my health. You know, that being said, it's, it's still a journey because I had some bad habits that I think contributed to my getting unwell in the first place. And then I naively came out of it thinking, I'll never be that way again. I've learned my lesson. And then I got thrown back into life. And right. it's just learning a whole new set of skills to take care of yourself with all of the de demands of life fully back. So yes, I am vigilant about my health. It's not perfect. It's still a work in progress, but I'm very much aware that I need to stay on top of it. And I've very much notice the effects of when I don't. 
Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's really one of the most important things. Um, one of the most important steps people can take um, on the journey to healing is is recognize it's an individual journey. And to, you know, I love the fact that you, you know, you actually have like a checklist. You probably got journals. I, I mean, you can, you know, data mm. is so important to be able to, um, you know, to, to learn from. And um, I'm not quite as disciplined as you are, um, but I'm I'm well aware of the fact that, that I can slip into bad habits. Um and and those over time will get me starting to slide back into some of the symptoms that I recognize as sort of a fatigue syndrome. And that's when I need to take a step back and reassess and say, OK, Scott, you got you know, you drank too much alcohol this week. You stayed up too late, you know, watching YouTube videos. You you know, you spent too many hours like writing or something like that. All right. I need to begin to back things off. And I think that's an important thing to be able to recognize that. And I think it's also one thing that I found in all of this is that when you've been through a severe health crash condition, like you or I and people watching have, and then you start to get better and then you start to feel some of those symptoms again, it can be very scary. Mm -hmm. But at least for me, because I'm on top of it and I don't let it go too far, I now know that I don't have to get terrified every time I don't feel well because I can actually turn things around really quickly. Because right. if you're not going months or years of trashing your body and being stressed mm -hmm. out, it, it doesn't take so long to get back there. So it's nice. I just remind myself, I'm like, okay, yeah, you've gone off the rails <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Couple days of good habits and you're going to be feeling pretty good again, which is amazing. Right. So for me, I think my, my largest driving um, consideration, what I saw in a lot of my patients was stress and mm -hmm. um uh, for so many people, I think that, you know, there might be an underlying factor. There might be a nutritional deficiency. There might be a degree of hypothyroidism. You know, there could be something going on in the gut. There could be a food sensitivity. You know, there's so many different factors we can consider. But what's interesting is that for a lot of people, as, as we kind of get into the complexity of figuring this out, that itself is a stressor. And, and I know that some people, you know, half of the stress is, is, is not knowing where to go or where to turn or who to trust or or, you know, what, what's the best diet? And, and I've seen a number of people who, who it's almost like the, the process of trying to get better is the actual process that spins their, you know, their stress response and their adrenal response into kind of maintaining this. So one of my, you know, personal goals is to try to help people to really ascertain, like, what, what is, what are the principal things that we need to address? I mean, like, if somebody does have, you know, chronic fatigue, it's like, yeah, it's going to cost a lot of stress if you're trying to find a good uh, biological dentist who's going to, you know, take out all of your fillings for less than $6,000. But is that the first thing that you need to be working on? Um, so I think that that's part of the, one of the things which is challenging for people is knowing how to, how to focus and what to address and, you know, sort of systematically to, to begin to turn around their health. So I know your tagline uh, with medicine is to think different. So what exactly does that mean for people who are facing conditions like ME-CFS or long COVID? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I think the first thing to do is, when it comes to thinking different is, is recognize that sort of this, um, you know, this mainstream medicine, you know, patriarchal, you know, drug pushing doctors is not necessarily the only way to approach one's fatigue. And I think a lot of people bounce between a lot of doctors, you know, they go to their generalist, they go to their endocrinologist, they go to their immunologist, they, you know, maybe they, they find themselves seeing an infectious disease specialist um, because they've got an equivocal Lyme test or something like that. Um, so the first thing we have to do is recognize that there's different ways of, of healing. And and so what's happened is in conventional medicine is we've boxed ourselves in and partly because of, you know, our insurance policies and stuff like that. What happens is um, we're left with making decisions based on a diagnosis. So, you know, a, a woman goes in to see her primary care doctor and what does she describe? Um, you know, not sleeping well, gaining weight, foggy thinking. So what is that? Well, you know, to conventional medicine, they go, oh, you're depressed, Right. So now you have your diagnosis code for depression. And what do you treat depression with? You use an antidepressant. It's pretty simple. You know, we're, we're you know, done thinking about it. And then when the antidepressant doesn't work, that's when you kind of get on that slippery slope of what's in your head. Uh, my next thing I'm going to do is send you to a psychiatrist because obviously I can't, you know, figure out what's wrong with that. So the first thing that we need to do when I say think different is we need to... Um, begin to ask different questions of what constitutes health and what constitutes disease. And, and I think we've been sort of shackled or handcuffed uh, by the conventional system into saying, your disease, your you know, you've got CFS, you've got AMI, you've got, you know, you've got post-COVID. 
But the problem mm-hmm. is that the way that our body's physiology works is that is that there are a lot of different factors, there are a lot of different systems, there are a lot of different you know, there's a lot of different biochemistry that's all contributing to that that diagnosis code, right? And I think that in order to think differently, we need to be able to start to um, ask different questions about just how do you define health and health and disease? I mean, what is wellness? You know, what is what is health? What is what is illness? Um, and I think that all that occurs on a spectrum. So instead of being kind of like this, uh, you know, this digital, you're sick or you're you know you're well or you have a disease. You know, um, what we what what I've come to realize is that that you know our biology is complex and it operates on a on a spectrum. And the real secret is to try to decide where we are on that spectrum. And then the important thing is just to ask the question, what in it, in our biology or our biochemistry is actually driving that, right? And then the other question is, is what is our perception in our brains? Are there some, I know you said that everyone is individual and has unique needs, of course, but I'm wondering in your experience, your approach, is there a more general approach that does have impact or um, success with a lot of people? Because I know we can get tied up in our diagnoses and be like, don't lump my long COVID in with your CFS. That's something different. And then someone else is like, don't lump your CFS with my ME. I need a completely (laughs) different treatment program. So how important have you found, you know, those labels or those diagnoses are and how, you know, generic or specific does treatment need to be? That's, that's interesting because as I mentioned, I think that, you know, life and, and the, you know, our, our experience of the world is, 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 it all occurs on a spectrum, you know, so, you know, one, one person's poison is another person's nectar. I mean, mm-hmm. so, so what's tricky is that I think it's important, you know, whether as a provider working with people to try to meet people where they are. So in other words, if, if, you know, if, if, if somebody has a perception of feeling fatigued or not having energy or foggy thinking or something like that, that's their reality and, and, and that's their perception. So I think that, you know, one, one of the most important things we need to do is to recognize that, you know, not everybody has the classic symptoms. Not everybody has, I don't know, what is it, 12 symmetric, you know, points of, of, of pain over their joints. And, and so as everyone's different, we need, we need to kind of um, look at everybody differently, I think. And, um, but over time, what I found is that there were some, some common themes that I've seen um, come out in a number of my patients. And, and being a scientist, what I've done is spent the last decade of my life saying, wait a minute, what, this is something I recognize in my clinical practice. What does the literature show? I mean, how, what, what does our research, what does, um, you know, what does the science show that could be contributing to this? Because when we're able to sort of deconstruct our thinking from like a big diagnosis to say, wait a minute, there, there are different um, biochemical reactions, there are nerves, there are muscles, there's nutrients and stuff that we all need to make our body work well. You know, there are certain pathways we need to detoxify. There are certain attentions we need to take to the way that our gut works. When we begin to take an individual and say, okay, let's look at, let's look at your gut. You've eaten nothing but porterhouse steaks for the last five years of your life. Okay, no vegetables, no vitamin C. All right, well, maybe this person, you know, isn't taking care of their microbiome of their, uh, of their gut. So just in, in taking a simple question, like, tell me about your diet, we can begin to understand what are the contributing factors that, that, that you know, that could be driving that individual case of post-COVID, you know, ME, you know, CFS, what, you know, whatever term that, we, that, that we're using to describe it. And I think in some ways that actually trying to use some of these terms is almost a, almost a detriment. Um, in my experience, when we're able to say, okay, look, here's, let's start with this, this individual. This person is a, a tabula rasa, which is a, a blank slate, right? Let's sit down and try to figure out what are the different factors that could be contributing to things. Because I'll use myself as an example. Um, I've always been a super healthy eater. I've always been an exerciser. Um, I basically wear the same pant size that I did when I was 19 years old in, in, in high school. So what, so it probably wasn't my diet that drove my personal, you know, episode with fatigue. What could it be? Oh, it was massive stressors that were coming to me from any number of different, different factors. So what I needed to address were the stressors. Um, I didn't need to make changes in my diet right offhand, although I, I did find that making some dietary changes helped me. Um, so I think that we, the most important thing is to try to you know, take a step back and say, okay, let's look at, at what might have, might have caused this. You know, like in your case, you describe having had a, um, you know, a, a, like a number of people in your family. And, and it sounds like you're the first person who, who has truly escaped um, this curse here, you know, the, the trendsetter. So congratulations on that. Um, so I think so when, when it comes to thinking different, I think the most important thing is to say, number one, let's not shackle ourselves with having to use diagnoses and diagnosis codes and limiting ourselves and saying, you get an antidepressant, 
you know, you get a uh, pain medication for your pain, you get some gabapentin to help you with the, you know, the mysterious nerve pain, or we're going to put you on a, a stimulant because that's the only way that we have to get you feeling better. We need to be able to uh, be more a little judicious about saying what happened to that person's um, biology and physiology. And as you know, all of our health is really, um, it's really our genetics within our environment. So, you know, our genetics are our genetics. I mean, it's what we're, we're born with. But we're learning that through this concept of what's known as epigenetics, and I, I would imagine you've, you've come across this, you know, we can actually make some, um, some choices and some decisions mm -hmm. to actually drive how our genes work. So, so that's, I think, one of the most important things in thinking different is saying we need to, um, we need to look across a broad spectrum of different possibilities. Um, not everybody has Lyme. Not everybody has heavy metals. Not everybody has black mold. Um, but if you take some time to look at individuals or work with people to help them to understand some, themselves, you might be able to focus your investigations a little more, a little more closely. In other words, if you live in Phoenix, Arizona, you're probably not suffering with black mold. You know, it's mm -hmm. so dry there. But if you're from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and you live in a household, you know, a hundred year old house, that might be something that you need to think about um, down the line. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm just thinking um, from your ebook, Think Different, which is an excellent ebook. I loved it. I feel like it's just a really good overview and foundation of understanding, you know, how our bodies, you know, heal and thrive. Um, but one of the things that you mentioned in there, which was something that I had said I wanted to ask you about, was around gut health because, you know, working on my gut health was a big part of. Um, my recovery puzzle wasn't everything, but it, it helped a lot. And a lot of other people say the same thing. But I think it can be confusing, you know, for someone watching right now, like, how do they know if their gut health is good or bad? And if it is not good, what are they supposed to do about it? And how does that impact things? How does that um, play into all of this? That's a great question. It's funny that this is actually something that I was just writing about um, last night. So it's it's timely. Um, so, so the gut... You know, as we know, there's so much data that's coming out these days about um, the relationship between our gut health and our whole body health. And I can tell you that when I was in medical school between um, 87 and 91, it was almost like the gut was, you know, food comes in, poop comes out. There's some bacteria in the gut. And other than that, you know, that, that's it. And now we're recognizing that, I mean, there are, you know, 100 trillion different bacteria that live in our gut. Um, we're learning that the, you know, the bacteria um, and the whole environment inside our gut is very potent at influencing our immune system. And as you know, the immune system is critical for, you know, for, for, for this discussion. But the other thing that we're learning is that the, um, the gut and some of the bacteria in the gut are also responsible for making neurotransmitters. And, you know, there's been data that's come out that suggests that much of the GABA, you know, the, the calming neurotransmitter that works in our brain is probably made in our gut and travels up through the vagus nerve back up into our brain uh, where it helps to keep us calm. So you asked the question like what, you know, for, for the viewers here today, like what are some really basic questions that you can ask yourself um, about your, your gut? And it's funny because that's what I was writing about last night. So there are a few questions that you can ask that are gonna give you some insight into how your gut is working. The first is how does your belly feel? And I know that this sounds very, very basic, um, but for those of us who know how to use diet to keep our gut in a healthy state, I know when, you know, in a day, if I've made some, you know, if I've made a mistake, if I had too much pizza, cause I've got a, you know, I've got lactose intolerance, um, you know, if I had too much meat over the last week or something like that. So just ask yourself, how do you feel? Um, the next thing that's really valuable to understand how the gut works is transit time and a healthy gut, something that you, um, that you eat should make it out, um, into your, into your stools probably within a couple days. And that's easily mm -hmm. tested. Um, you know, people talk about using, say, charcoal, for example, and you can, mm -hmm. you know, mix up some charcoal into a glass of water and drink it and uh, see when your stools turn dark. I mean, that's not my preferred way of going about it. Uh, but personally, uh, when I want to check in and know what my uh, transit time is, I will have some beets. And, and you'll notice that there'll be sort of a, a reddish coloration in the stools. So that's, that's really simple. So number one, how do you feel? Number two, um, you know, what, what's your transit time? Um, you can also get some insight into, into how your gut is working as well by just simple questions of, you know, do you feel um, gassy? Are you burping? Are you bloated? Um, do you know, uh, do, you ha do you have any pain? And then probably one of the last things that I, that I think is valuable to, that there's just like a, a bedside test is what is the character of your stools? I mean, do you have loose stools that are more like diarrhea? Do you have um, firm, constipated stools? Um, because not only is the gut transit important as well, I think one of the most, the most important questions is how often do you poop? 
Um, so here we again, you know, talk about what is considered normal because as a doctor, if I would say, are, is your bowel frequency normal? Someone say, yeah, doc, it's normal. It's fine. I poop every five days. It's normal. It's been <laughs> for years. Well, that's, that might be normal for that individual, but that's not, not optimal. So I think that in terms of um, actually passing stool, I, I think that if you're having a bowel movement less than um, once a day, that could be a sign that, that one of the places that you're going to need to look at um, is in your gut. Um, because the gut is, does a couple of really important things. You know, one is it's our primary detoxification organ. So mm -hmm. I'm sure you've talked about detox and, you know, phase one and phase two and all that stuff. But the whole point of phase two detoxification is to take the toxins make them water soluble and get rid of them in the, in the stool or in the urine or through the skin when we sweat. The other, the other thing that the gut is so vitally important for is instructing our immune system. So let me share some, just some cool facts with you. Okay. So I'm, I'm sure you know that the, you know, the gut, if we were to take all the little crypts and valleys and, and uh, what they're called villi, if you were to spread that all flat, it would be about the size of a doubles tennis court. So there's this enormous amount of physical area that our, that constitutes the lining of our gut. And it's probably because that's how much, you know, surface area we need to take every last morsel of amino acid and fat and sugar that we've eaten and absorb it. Because, you know, as we know, um, humans, uh, for a lot of the time we've been on this planet, haven't had, you know, 24 hours super saves and McDonald's where we can just go grab some food. So when we were able to, you know, stumble upon a mango or, or you know, find some berries or stuff, we wanted to extract all the nutrition possible. But what's interesting is that our immune system is tuned to be able to locate a virus, for example, a viral particle over this, over this, you know, doubles tennis court amount of space. So think about it. A virus is like 10 billionths of a meter in diameter. So imagine trying to find something that's 10 billionths of a meter in size on a, on a doubles tennis court. Of course, it's impossible, but our immune system can do that. So it turns out that something like 75% to maybe 80% of our immune cells are located within the centimeter below the lining of the gut. So as I'm sure you and your viewers know, um, one of the things that's agreed upon is that there is an immunological component um, with these fatigue syndromes. Uh, I mean, whether it's an, whether it's an active infection, um, whether it's an, you know, maybe there might be a, an autoimmune process. I think that, you know, the jury is still kind of out in terms of just knowing exactly what, what drives this and what genetics are involved. But the vast majority of our immune system is located just below the lining of the gut. It's like, uh, you know, having a castle and, um, and having your soldiers lined up around the parapets, you know, to make sure that the, you know, the, the, the intruders don't, don't get in. Um, so the gut's really important. I mean, it makes our neurotransmitters. It conducts our, our detoxification process. It, it, we're learning that our dietary choices and the types of bacteria that we have in our gut are actually an active communication with our immune system. So the immune system negotiates with the bacteria and has ways of influencing them. The bacteria conversely have ways of trying to drive different aspects of our immune system. So there's really a symbiotic relationship that's going on there. So with those, you know, simple questions that I started this part of the discussion with, um, how do you feel? How often do you poop? What's your transit time? Do you have gas? Do you have bloating? Um, these are some simple questions to just begin to get us to think about, wow, could the gut be... Um, you know, something that I need to be focusing on in, in, in my journey to healing. And if you do find that it is something that you need to focus on, what then? Okay, that's great. And, and you know, you earlier alluded to something that I think is so important, which is, um, you know, probably we, we all need more vegetables in our diet. I mean, when I kind of jokingly, say, you know, use the example of the guy who eats nothing but porterhouse steaks, that was said with a little bit of, you know, a little bit of irony, but there's something to be said about the fact that all the research these days is showing that basically the more vegetables, the more fiber that we consume in our diet, the healthier our, our, our gut is. Now, what happens is that doesn't mean that someone needs to just go on and say, oh, I'm just going to become a vegan. I'm going to become a vegetarian. I'm never going to eat meat because meats contain important nutrients. They contain amino acids. They contain choline. They contain vitamin B6, B12, um, and, and stuff like that. But the biggest picture I would say for most Americans, I think that too many of us are eating processed foods. Too many of us are focusing on processed meats and, you know, like driving into the Wendy's and grabbing a hamburger or something like that. And the more that we could focus on whole foods and more of a plant-based diet, these are all the components that, that actually help to modulate and improve the health of our uh, bacterial balance, this microbiome. 
And then when that gets better, then our immune system has an opportunity to tamper down and, and, and feel a little more secure. It's not continually at war. I'm so I'm lost in thought here. I'm thinking my husband is currently doing a carnivore diet. I'm like, I need to uh, play play this clip to him. <laughs> well, but but, but, you know, the, but there also might be a time and a place for a carnivore diet. Let, let me say that yeah. in my experience, that for someone who doesn't have fatigue, let's just say they're struggling with obesity, is yeah. that some of these you know some of these paleo style diets that avoid avoid the carbohydrates really yeah. help people to have more energy and to lose weight as well. So uh, there's a time and a place for all these things. He seems to be doing amazing. It just stresses me out. I want to time down and force some vegetables into him. But right. <laughs> and, and he's, so, he so I don't think that great. would be a problem. I mean, if he's on that, you know, high carnivore diet for five years, mm -hmm. unquestionably, that's going to expose his body to a number of the types of fat um, that are more present in meats that are associated with inflammation. And as you know, these are these omega-6 mm -hmm. fats, right, that are pro-inflammatory. Um you're not going to have the benefit of all the phytonutrients. And these are the chemicals that are found in plants, you know, whether it's the luteins or carotenes or zeaxanthins, you know, all these different chemicals that we know are really beneficial for, for helping, again, to modulate our immune system and just keep our cells healthy. If we're not eating the right foods or, you know, supplementation was something else that we talked about, which is a hot topic. And many of us are confused about, and some of us a bit jaded about because we've spent thousands of dollars and never really sure if it did anything. And, um, and then I think sometimes people use it like a get out of jail free card. Like oh, I'll just eat like crap, but I take a multivitamin. So I'll be fine. Right. So in right. your experience, what role do supplements play? Well, um, let, me, let me just kind of follow on what you're just saying just for one more uh, comment and observation, which is, you know, part of the problem with allopathic medicine, which is the way that I was trained, which is the style of saying, pick a diagnosis, you know, pick a drug, treat a symptom, is a lot of people sadly seem to forget that, that that's the mainstream sort of modality in medicine, which is pick a drug. And they start to look for the exact same thing with supplements. Like I'm going to pick a supplement that's going to give me energy, that's going to fix my fatigue, that's going to, you know, improve my libido, that's going to, you know, do all these things. So it's important to remember that supplements, it's right there in the word, right? Supplements should be supplemental. And that's that one I think is one of the most, most important things. And in a, you know, best case environment, if we're able, if our gut's working well and our stress levels are good and, and, and we make good nutritional choices, you know, I think a, a number of us can actually um, get by without using supplementation. But I live in British Columbia, Canada, for example, where, as you know, um, you know, it's, there's clouds in the sky for, you know, 15 days out of six, you know, 15 out of 16 days or something like that. <laughs> I don't have the resources to be able to activate my vitamin D appropriately. Mm -hmm. So one of the supplements that for me is vitally important is to take my vitamin D. Somebody who's a surfer who lives in San Diego and is out on the water every day in their board shorts may not actually actually need that. So I think the important thing with supplementation is one, remember it's supplemental. Two, mm -hmm. recall that, that there's not a lot of oversight in terms of the, the quality of the supplements that we're using. And I would, you know, at some point, you and I should talk about the, I think it was in like 2014, the New York attorney, attorney general issued a cease and desist to Walmart, Target, like a couple other stores, because what they found is that the supplements that they were selling by DNA, you know, genetic analyses had absolutely none of the products that were, that were listed on the label. So... You know, just imagine how many people are spending $1,000 a month on yeah. their supplements and, and they're taking, you know, ground up house plants. As a matter of fact, in my last practice, I had a Dracaena plant, which is a, you know, it was a good, good low light plant in my office, but it was one of the plants that was found to be ground up in, in, in the supplements. And I was like, I'm getting that plant, I'm just going to put it in my office just as a reminder that if we're going to use supplements, we don't want to first identify what supplements that first, no, let me take a step back. Don't use supplements like allopathic medicines. There's not going to be one supplement that's just going to give you the energy or make your libido come back or something like that. It needs to be part of this whole picture. Um, number two, use uh, supplements ideally when you've used laboratory tests to identify what it is that you need to supplement. I mean, are you B12 deficient? Are you um, zinc deficient? Are you vitamin D deficient? We can measure so many of these things. And then the last thing with supplementation is uh, use it from a good purveyor. And I can tell you that, you know, personally, um, I recommend supplements from uh, Thorn. Uh, Metagenics. Uh, I've physically, personally toured both of these factories and walked through them and see how they, you know, 
seeing their, um, you know, the high level of quality control, you know, seeing their, their certificate, certificates of authenticity. And, and the other, the other, um, uh, supplement company that I like is, um, Douglas Labs. They make some great herbal products as well. Um, so that's uh, what the important thing is that don't use supplements like drugs. Um, that's what we're trying to get away from, right? There's not one pill that's going to, one supplement that's going to fix everything. Um, use directed supplementation. In my medical practice, if I had somebody on more than six supplements, I would take a step back and say, wait a minute, we're not doing something right. And it reminds me of a story of a, a patient of mine who came in with literally like a shopping bag filled with supplements. And she was taking this that her hairdresser recommended and her naturopath recommended this and her regular doctor recommended this. And, and she's taking all these different things and she felt like crap. I said, let's do one thing. Let's just let's stop taking everything for a month. Let's just see how you feel. Nothing else, no testing, no, nothing else, no change in her diet. She came back a month later and she said, doc, I feel so good. I can't believe it. So she saved $600 a month. You know, she, 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 it, it was, it was a reductive approach to medicine, not continually adding things. One of the things that I really appreciate and I think is so helpful is that you really encourage people to be stewards of their own health care. So for people watching right now, they're currently facing, you know, ME-CFS, long COVID, something like this. What does that mean? Because all of this is all very useful information, but like, they're like, okay, what do I do next? How do I, how do I approach this? Right. Wow. That's a, um, that's a, that's a, uh, you know, uh, that's a big question because <laughs> the first thing that we have to realize, I believe, is that we are the own, our own best stewards of our health. You know, don't get me wrong. I mean, if I'm in a car wreck and, you know, let the paramedics, you know, package me up and bring me to a hospital, let it, let, you know, let a surgeon fix my leg or something like that. But for, for, for chronic conditions, I think that we are the ones who are best suited to understand and ask the questions of how's our gut working? What is our, what is our stress level? And, and I believe that while medicine has been, um, you know, sort of, uh, separated as like, oh, if you've got the smarts to be a doctor because you're an osteopath or a medical doctor or a naturopath or a chiropractor, th there's nothing about what I know or the other doctors that uh, a, you know, person with a high school education couldn't learn. And I think that, you know, it's really easy to get into the weeds in terms of medicine. We don't need to do that. And really my, one of my personal missions in life is to, is in, is in working to deconstruct some of these complexities to actually, you know, create programs, create systems where an individual who's been to all the different doctors, they're really getting frustrated because they haven't been able to figure out what's going on can say, wait a minute, let me, let me take a step back. I'm smart. I can read. I can understand some, you know, some, some basic concepts about, you know, science and health. I, you know, I, I can make some personal choices about my sleeping, my, you know, my blue blocking glasses, my, you know, how late I stay up at night, you know, in front of, in front of the, the computer. So I think that, that we have the potential to be best stewards of our health. And what's really cool is that the internet and our access to good information is, is opening up a whole new venue to really empower people. And, and my mission is to empower people so well that we over time, uh, teach the doctors through the back door. And a classic example is, is thyroid. I mean, how, you know, how many times have you heard that, you know, someone has a TSH of four or five and they go into their doctor and the doctor goes, that's all we need to do. That's fine. That's a normal thyroid. Well, what I want to do is I want to create um, access where that person can go, wait a minute, I've got dry hairs, dry skin, constipation, I'm gaining weight. And I've got foggy thinking. Maybe my TSH of four is not normal. They go to a lab where they order a blood test. They prick their finger in the privacy of their own home, and they recognize that, yes, their TSH is four, but their free hormones, which I believe are the better way of actually measuring thyroid, are off the scale. I think that what's going to happen is that over time when we get those people going back to the doctors and saying, you've been telling me for two years, I've, you know, I've lost two years of my life with gaining weight, feeling crappy, dry hair, dry skin, constipation, you know, all this stuff, and look... Just getting that TSH was not what we needed to really understand what was happening with my thyroid. Here is more data. I'm optimistic that over time that when a well-intended doctor is like, wow, that's the third time this month that someone came into my office showing that they're, even their normal TSH, let's say it's 2.5. I mean, I've got somewhere on my computer, my personal thyroid numbers, and my TSH is smack dab in the middle. My free T3 and my free T4 are at the very, very end of the normal range. And one of the few medicines that I use, really the only medication I use, is Armour Thyroid to optimize my thyroid. But if all you measured on me was my TSH, it would look normal. 
what I'm hearing from all of that and what I've read, either it was on your website or in your ebook, which will all be linked in the video description for people um, that want to learn more. Um, but just, I really love basically it's empowering people and having that trust in yourself and our knowledge of our body. Cause I read somewhere you said something along the lines of, you know, who knows more about your body, the doctor that met you five minutes ago, you know, or you that's been living with this for however long. Right. So I think a lot of us, when we first get into this, we just blindly follow whatever doctor tells us to do. And I'm not saying disregard medical advice. It's just, right. you know, initially I never put any thought into it. I didn't think right. I had a say and I didn't think my knowledge or expertise had any value. So uh, right. it's taking ownership, having um, that empowered feeling um, and working on yeah. things together instead of just blindly. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah. love that. And, and I think that's a, you know, that's a, that's a really important take home message, which is, you know, for the people watching this channel right now to, you know, have, understand that you are the best person to understand your body. You are smart enough to under, to be able to, um, you know, approach your, your illness with a, you know, with a coherent and, you know, like a re realistic approach. I mean, if, if somebody's telling you that you need to have all your fillings taken out, you need uh, weekly antibiotics for Lyme and you need to, you know, move out of your house because of the black mold, that's not a realistic you know, recommendation at that, at that time, because that's not happening to everybody. So I like that. I think that it's important to remember that we are the best stewards of our own healthcare. And, and really my mission is to try to create, make this approachable to people and, and actually hold people's hands and, 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 and continue to encourage individuals to stand up for themselves. But if I could give all your viewers just a, you know, a take home message that would be have faith in the fact that you you know your body the best. You are smart enough to figure this out. And what I'm trying to do is to provide resources to actually take people's hands and guide them through. Let's go about this in a sensible way. You know, like step one in, in the programs I work on with people is not take all your fillings out, I assure you. It's look at your nutrition. Um, you know, the second step is look at how your insulin, thyroid, and cortisol work. You need to be thinking about how the gut works how we, and how we detoxify and how inflamed we are. And my experience has shown that, that, that this can be arranged in, in sort of like almost an algorithmic, say, systematic fashion. That There are certain things that our biology requires that need to be satisfied first for our higher order um, you know, functions like our brain and our reproductive cas uh, capacity to work down the line. So what kind of work do you do with patients or what resources do you have available for people um, who are facing these sorts of conditions? So what I've done is um, I'm actually partly because I'm in Canada. I'm not I'm not actually seeing patients on a one to one you know, clinical um, place, but I'm working full time. And what I'm doing is I'm creating programs to actually walk people through just oh, really just what we've talked about in this um, in, in this uh, in this talk, which is. What are, the, what are the steps that I can do to begin to make some assessments about my health? What are the, what are the locations I've lived that, that might put me at a, at a certain risk for having this nutritional deficiency? I mean, people in the Midwest or the U.S. are notoriously deficient in iodine because when the glaciers came through 20,000 years ago, it scoured iodine from the soils. Vegetarians and vegans, if they don't supplement, are low in B6 and B12, as are women who are on um, oral contraceptives. Um, so one of the first steps is to really take a step back and do a self-assessment self and begin to ask the questions of, of where might I need to, to do some testing? Because I think that so much of this testing is accessible to people online. And then in my clinical practice, I can tell you that 90% of what I did did not require my DEA license. I didn't need to be prescribing drugs. I was prescribing mind body practices and dietary changes and exercise changes and working on sleep patterns and, and, and working on nutritional status through um, supplementation and, and, and optimizing nutrition. Right. Well, this is all really excellent and very helpful. And for people watching, all of this is in the video description. So I really encourage you to expand that and take a look because Dr. Resnick has some really amazing information on his website and various spaces. And if you watching enjoyed this video, I'm going to link one up here uh, from a woman named Donna who recovered doing a lot of the things that Dr. Resnick is talking about. She's got a really incredible story. So thank you so much to you, uh, Dr. Blessings Resnick. to you. And I wish the best to everyone out there in uh, YouTube land. And just know that have faith. You're going to get better. It's possible. So that's, that, that'd be my closing words. And thank you to those of you watching as well. Really looking forward to your comments. They are always so insightful and it's just so great to keep the conversation going. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got something out of it and I hope to see you in this next one.